Welcome to our epic ocean, where critical solutions to a planet in peril are brought to the surface. Our epic ocean celebrates all that is epic about the ocean and why it is the planet's most vital resource. And now to our host, Rich Gurman. Welcome to the show, everyone. It's Rich. And um, I'm really excited about today. I created this show out of a love for the ocean, specifically for dolphins and whales, and really a, de a deep desire that I have to learn about solutions and share them with you. And today I'm honored to have a man whose work is 100% focused on solutions. He's the founder of the Oceanic Preservation Society. He's a, f a photographer turned filmmaker. He's made three celebrated documentary films you've probably seen. All of them, the first one being The Cove, which won the Academy Award for Best Documentary back in 2009, and then Racing Extinction, and most recently, The Game Changers. Uh, Luis Ojoyas, welcome to the show. Thank you, Rich. Great, great to be here. I'm so glad to have you here. You and I are both blessed with names that people probably botch all of the time. <laughs> oh, it makes you feel special, though, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I, li I always like correcting people. It's good. It makes me feel important. No, just kidding. So I'm thinking that it might be appropriate to talk about where you are today and then kind of work backwards a little to, uh, you know, if you are game for that, we'll just we'll start with Game Changers and work our way back. Is that cool? Sure. Beautiful. So as someone who has spent countless hours with dolphins every day for the past 11 years, including this morning, uh, for me, The Cove was a real game changer, but I do want to start with The Game Changers. In my opinion, the best thing that anyone can do to help the planet, let alone the animals, and for their own personal health is to adopt a plant-based diet. And to me, the genius of this movie that it wasn't like in your face, you know, be a good human, stop eating uh, animals. Mm -hmm. You didn't shame people. Instead, you focused on personal performance using stories and science. I'm assuming this was a very conscious decision, yes? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good question. You know, um, I'm, I'm really involved with the science of social change, you know, not just, uh, you know, what's, a, what's important, but what works. Very, very different, you know, if you, and we sort of work backwards from, you know, looking at, there was a white paper done with, you know, it's called like the vegan mafia. They, they had spent, you know, tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars every year uh, working at, on the issue of you know people using animals for consumption, and co but coming at it through animal rights, and they they found that they were stuck like at a you know single digit percentage of the of the population that will even hear the message and change behavior, and what they found was that um, you're limited to like seven percent of the population as long as people believe that you need animal products to be strong, have endurance, and have virility, you're screwed. And so we worked on, okay, well, who would be the messengers? In that scenario um, where people are more interested in, let's say, human health, uh, who would be this, the, you know, the delivery, what would be the delivery mechanism? And we settled on professional athletes, you know, like not just any athlete, but like, you know, world's strongest guy by one measure of carrying more weight for than anybody in history, in human history. Patrick Baboumian carried 1,255 pounds. That's the weight of a horse, 10 meters. Um, Scott Zurich, probably the most accomplished ultra runner in the world, won seven states, you know, uh, this is a hundred mile race in, in a row. He won, won it seven <laughs> times. He's, uh, he's ran further than any American in one 24 hour period, uh, 165 miles plus. Uh, he ran the Appalachian Trail. That's where we documented him doing that during this film. Um, you know, so, you know, we have strength endurance and virility we do this wonderful experiment you know it's not as you know it's it's a it's a scientific experiment but not like peer-reviewed in the sense of like we didn't have a big sub sample but we gave you know collegiate athletes a plant-based meal and we've had this uh device on it was basically a computer that measures nocturnal erections and uh then the, the following evening you know we gave them a meat-based meal and of course, opposed to the plant-based meal, the plant-based meal, they had a 10.4% a bigger, harder erection and a 350% longer duration erection with these nocturnal erections that a, a, a male has in, uh, uh, through the evening. These aren't to do with wet dreams. It's just it's the body right. telling, you know, that we really need to have a, you know, blood going to an important organ. So the, the film is, you know, it's science-based and it's, um, 
and it's entertaining. You know, first rule of, inter- of, of any documentary, any film is like, be entertaining. And we, we start with that, but we also start with the idea like, what's the, the you know, what's gonna work? You know, how, you know what's, what, what's the action you want people to take? And how are you gonna penetrate? And I, I guess to the, you know, the, a big team, not just me working on this film, obviously there's, you know, hundreds of people, but the, um, you know, the first 30 days that film was on Netflix, Worldwide searches for plant-based diet went up 350 percent. You know, it was the most popular documentary. I was told, and in, in, the, in the first nine days, it was on Apple iTunes. It was the most popular documentary mm-hmm. in their history. So the film, Amazing. you know, it's entertaining. You know, and it's you know, people come back and they realize that yeah, it's not a, um, it's not a, um, you know, a, a dry documentary. All our all of our films are entertaining. That's how you. That's the first rule of penetrating through the. <laughs> You know all the choices that people have. I, I found them all super entertaining, and we'll we'll talk about racing extinction. Obviously, that was that was harder to watch, though. <laughs> not as entertaining. Uh, there was nothing about erections and in, in <laughs> racing extinction. That's for darn sure. So this myth that we need so much animal protein. Do you think that this is just perpetuated by the meat industry? Is big pharma involved in this also? Healthy people obviously are bad for business. What's your take? I, th- I think yeah, the marketing in this industry. Yeah, I mean we're you know we're we're eating way more animal products than we ever have in history. We're eating a lot of bad food. You know, a lot of processed food. Um, yeah, it's multidimensional. You know, we're you know if you look at you know, the blue zones. You know, these are the five areas of the planet where people live the longest. 95% of their calories come from a, a whole foods, plant-based diet. Um, you know, they live on average 10 to 12 years longer without chronic disease. I mean, how many people are out there on like, you know, blood thinners for cholesterol and, you know, diabetic medications and, you know, 85% of those, uh, the chronic diseases that we have can be reversed Simply, but, but well, I don't want to make it too simple, but you know, by a plant-based diet, um, with, according to the Blue Zones, there's nine pillars. There's four or five other pillars that people use, but there's a lot of intersection. Whole foods, plant-based diet, um, exercise, a sense of mission or purpose, a community that that you're that loves you, that they 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 get you, that they understand you, that you feel like there's a need to live, very important. And um, you know, some people say sleep is really important. And also relaxation, you know, not getting your cortisol levels up, not living in this this constant stress that we, you know, we're in these days. And that's, you know, that's the, that's the key. But, you know, certainly putting the right fuel in the tank makes a lot of sense. You know, you don't, you know, we're, we're, there's a wonderful line by Patrick Baboumian in the film. He, you know, said, people say, ask him, he said, like, how do you get as strong as an ox, you know, without eating meat? And he says, have you ever seen an ox eating meat? <laughs> That's you know, right. all protein originates in plants. So, um, you know, there, there's, a, there's a real myth that's, that's killing us. It's, it's the, if you want to change the world, we, we're going through this huge existential crisis, right? It's a, the oceans are dying. You have 800 dead zones. You have, you know, the, um, the, the, the oceans heating up, the coral reefs disappearing in just a few generations. You know, 25% of the species on the planet live, uh, in the oceans live on coral reefs. Those are disappearing. I was just reading this book by Bill Gates, and he's talking about how we're, you know, it, it's in the, that he sort of d- dismisses the idea that we can save them. It's like, this is what's going, and, and meat is at the nexus of, of a lot of our, our problems. You know, the biggest cause of freshwater pollution, one of the biggest causes of diseases, chronic diseases, et cetera, et cetera. It's a win, win, win. It's a win for the, the animals. It's a win for the oceans. It's a win for the, the planet. And, you know, if you want to change the world, change what's on your plate. You know, eat more of a plant-based diet. Simple as that. It really is. And you you mentioned a couple minutes ago you didn't want to oversimplify eating a plant-based diet, exercise, meditation, lowering your stress levels. It is that simple. It really is. Um, and that's what I loved about this movie. Um, I think a lot of people get overwhelmed when they look at everything that you said, climate change, ocean acidification, sea level rising and whatnot, and they want to feel like they can be part of the solution and not just adding to the problem. And that's why I love the Game Changers because it provides a real solution that not only helps our own personal health. In fact, if we really were to back up and look at the three films you made, right? And we'll talk about them all. The Cove for me was about how we treat animals. Racing Extinction 
is how we treat the planet as a whole and animals, obviously. And then the game changers is how we treat ourselves. I'm curious, were you consciously painting a big picture of the undoing of our planet or was this, was this a happy accident or a, a calculated vision? It, it was a little bit of both. Um, um, my best friend, Jim Clark, um, he's a guy who started Netscape, Silicon Graphics, WebMD, um, Shutterfly, you know, um, has a hand in Palantir, is a, uh, help, you know, send man to the moon. Um, he's the guy that got me started in this business with, with the game changers. <sighs> but, you know, Jim got me started in this, and you know, if you wanted me to do a, a, a film about the declining oceans, and I was pretty overwhelmed. I was a still photographer, and you know, used to taking on big subjects for National Geographic. You know, we would do <laughs> films. So it was, we'd do like stories like on the Byzantine Empire in like thirty pages. I did a story on the Mesozoic. That's the midlife of the planet, one hundred and sixty-five million years in, uh, in thirty-five pages. You know, um, so I'm used to taking on big, big subjects, but I never had done a film before. And so, so Jim says, yeah, like, okay, I'll finance you to do a film about the oceans. And on the way to researching this, you know, what was going on, it was really overwhelming. And at one of these conferences, as a, you know, a, a whale and dolphin conference down in, in San Diego, um, Rick O'Berry, the guy that captured and trained the five female dolphins that collectively played the part of Flipper, he was going to talk about um, what's going on in Japan, where they were killing, you know, dolphins for humans' consumption. And, uh, and... It, over time, I realized that we could talk about what's going on in the oceans by looking at this one little body of water, this cove in Taiji, Japan, where, like I said, they kill more dolphins than any other place in the world. And, um, you know, William Blake, you know, said, you know, to see the world in a grain of sand. I thought, well, if we could, we could look at all those issues that Jim and I were concerned about, you know, overfishing pollution you know dolphins have some of the most toxic meat of any animal in the world any anywhere from five to five thousand times more mercury for instance th than allowed by um fish if it were a fish of course it's a mammal um we could look at all the you know what we're doing to these uh, our counterparts in the ocean just by taking a, a smaller look you know kind of a microscope onto the oceans instead of looking at this grandiose view and then after the success of that film i thought okay now i can take on that film that Jim originally set me off to do, which is looking at the Anthropocene, the sixth mass extinction on the planet. You know, there's been five major extinctions on the history of the planet. We're going through one right now that's caused by humanity. And I was real, because of the work I had done at, for National Geographic as a still photographer, I had done four stories on the Mesozoic. I was, I felt like I was prepared to take on a big subject. I had the, the, the knowledge of, of, you know, how to do it, how to tell a good story. But also that, you know, the importance, you know, when you, when you do a, a, doc, a documentary like The Cove or Racing Extinction, it takes five years. It's a big commitment. You have to wake up every morning and, like, it's, you, you can't be doing a job that's, um, that you don't want to go to, you know, because it, <laughs> it, it, it costs a lot of money to do this work. You have to, you know, motivate people to work long hours and hard and, you know, wake up before a sunrise and go to bed when, you know, late and then wake up the next day and do it for weeks and sometimes months at a time. And so you have to be driven, you know, the, the whole team has to be motivated to be able to do this kind of work because it's, it's tough. And, and if it's not, you know, if it's not something you really care about, you're not passionate about, you know, um, it's easy to get demoralized and, you know, run out of money and not have the, you know, what it takes to get to the, get to the end. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was kind of a, a, a conceptual idea that evolved, you know, let's look, let's look at the oceans, the cove. And by the way, for people that haven't seen the cove, the cove, you know, I'm told by a lot of people that in the film industry, it was the most winning documentary in history. It was the first documentary to sweep all the film guilds. It's a fun movie. You know, it's got, it's a dark movie. It's got, a, it's got this, this dip, but you know, at the end of the film, you know, it leaves people cheering. Um, mm. You know, it's a it's a good story. Rick O'Berry's story is a good story. What we're what we're, you know, it's, it's very compelling. Um, Racing Extinction. Um, I, I love that film. You know, we we have this. You know, you said it was hard to watch, and you know, I haven't seen it in a while. But there's, uh, again, I want to I want to bring people up higher than we take them down. That's kind of the key. Fisher Stevens, um, a producer I worked with for, for several films now, he said, you want to, you know, you need to peep, hit people with, on act one with what's going on, but you, you should, you know, strive to leave them higher than you've left them. You know what I mean? Don't leave them depressed. Yeah. 
Um, but we do these marvelous, uh, you know, this one thing I'm really proud of is we do these, you know, to, to change the world, to ch you don't need 51%. You only need 10% of the population. And that's not just sort of some number picked out of the air. There's a wonderful paper called The, the Science of Social Change. And they looked at the suffragette movement, civil rights movement, Arab Spring. And they found that once you have 10% of the population, 100% activated, like they're, they're convinced that this is the truth, that it's unstoppable. These waves happen, and, and then you, you don't even know how it happens. But the truth is really hard to stop. I'll give you an example. You know, like uh, technological um, innovations usually only take about 10 years to grab hold, or like a really good idea. You know, for instance, in 1900 in New York City, the Easter Parade, there's a wonderful picture taken from Broadway at the top of a building looking down, and it was all horses, you know, as far as you could see, except for one car. Now, remember, you know, we, we sort of paint a, um, you know, a, a wonderful picture of horse-drawn carriages in New York, but there's 20,000 tons of manure on the streets in New York every day. It's, you're, you're dragging it on your shoes and boots into the classroom, into the home, into the offices. There's flies everywhere. It stinks. The sailors could smell the urine and the feces from the horses from six miles out of New York Harbor before they sailed in. So... Horses weren't a pretty sight. They were just a, a means of locomotion. So now imagine all those people in the Easter parade looking at that one guy with the car. Now, 13 years later, it had been reversed. It was like all cars find the horse. You know, that was 10 years. You know, you think, well, that was then. But, you know, now it's, it's a little bit trickier. But, you know, 13 years, that's a 13-year segment, right? There's 13 years ago. You know, now maybe 15 now, we were punching the number two key six times on our flip phone to text a capital C. You know, <laughs> and, you know, I've been in the, in the wave of these, you know, uh, the, the front line of a, of a few movements like the uh, alternative energy movement. I had a, a 2002 uh, fully electric car. It was a Toyota RAV powered by 120 solar panels. And, you know, back in the, you know, the early part of the 2000s, people thought we were crazy. And I'd say, oh, I should drive this car. It's an amazing car. It wasn't a Tesla, but it was like, you know, I didn't pay for gasoline. I didn't pay for, you know, electricity. I went from having a, a, a $1,000 electric bill between Ops, my company, and my home every month to having a, a check from the electric company for two, for excess uh, production uh, for between two and $600. Um, and I, it's it's taken what now, you know I don't know fifteen years for the rest of the culture to to catch on. You know one thing we did in Racing Extinction is we had a bond car like we took a, a Tesla Model S and we turned you know it had a electro first car in the world to have an electro uh, electroluminescent paint job. We used it as kind of a reverse camouflage because we we pull up and do these projections were you know semi legal. And then, you know, people would call the police that we'd, that we'd turn it off and the, the Tesla would zoom into traffic as a, as a normal car. We had a FLIR camera, a forward-looking infrared camera that came out of the front where the engine would normally be. And you could uh, see carbon dioxide or methane and then project it out of a... Uh, there was out of the back, we had like a 20,000 lumen projector on a robotic arm so we could project it onto skyscrapers what that camera was seeing. Uh, we, you know, we had um, license plates that, you know, were... You know, uh, you know, invisible plates and stuff. So we had a we had a real Bond car, and mm -hmm. that partially to you know make it a cool film and make it exciting. But the idea was that uh, you know when in 2012 we were interviewing Elon, I think for that Elon Musk for that that film, and he uh, he said you know Louis, this is in October. He said Louis, uh, can we you know put it off till next quarter? And I said why? He says well I could uh, I, I might go bankrupt. You know, I've got to, I've got to hit my numbers. Otherwise, we not, may not make it. I said, yeah, of course. So then, you know, fast forward now, like he's been trading, you know, going from going bankrupt to being the second or first richest guy in the world. You know, so these revolutions, you know, real um, disruptions, you know, are um, I, I like to, I like to hang out on that edge where you can cause the most, the most change because we need to change things quick. And films are the most powerful weapon in the world that we have to create social change. When, when we did the COVID, they were killing 23,000 dolphins every year for human consumption. The, uh, the last time, I think, I, I remember the results, um, they killed, I think it was 610. So it's like a 93% drop of dolphin deaths because of the activism around that film. Uh, Racing Extinction, we do these 
because of the film and the projections that we do, we did, you know, we wanted to alert people with the film what was going on with the Anthropocene. We're set to lose maybe half the species on the planet by the end of the century. You know, if, if Bill Gates is right, we could lose 25% of the species in the ocean in just the next generation. So, in the, so to alert people to this, we didn't just make the film. We did projections of endangered species on the, on the Empire State Building. You know, and I think, you know, people said, you know, our distributor said, oh, it's going to cost too much money. You know, uh, we were doing it in the summer in New York. They said, well, all the important people are going to be over in the Hamptons or over in Europe on vacation. The media won't show up because they can't afford people to work overtime. And we had 600, no, we had 939 million media views just in the English language by Thursday. We did this on a Saturday night. Top, top trending story on Facebook and Twitter for four days worldwide. And we thought, wow. okay, we, we, we're close to that 10% number now, right? We're over the top. We thought we couldn't get any more success than that. And then the Pope called. The Pope wanted us to project endangered species on the Vatican during uh, COP21, you know, in Paris when world leaders were meeting, you know, to decide referendums on climate change. And I think we had 4.4 billion media views on that in the English language, 600 media were there, 225,000 people, you know, in St. Peter's Square, you know, it was, uh, you know, now I think, you know, because of a lot of work of a lot of people in the film, you know, the, I'm not saying, you know, we'd make a film and you change the world, but you become part, part of this chorus. And, mm -hmm. you know, when you can get people emotionally attached to a subject and you give them the information, they become part of that 10% number, then we have a chance to change in the world. That is incredible. So I love that 10% stat. Um, going back to the food revolution, the percentage of vegetarians and vegans is still small. You might have better numbers than me, but I think it's around three and a half percent of the U.S. is vegan, less than 1% of all humans on the planet. But that number is growing, thanks in part to the work that you're doing. What percentage of the people need to be plant-based to make a significant impact around things like climate change? You need one. You need one person to have a significant impact. You know, one person eats about 10,000 animals in their lifetime. You know, every year they consume because of animal. If, you, if you're eating animals, you consume about 400,000, 401,000 gallons of fresh water, um, 9,000 square feet of space that additionally has to be used to, you know, to feed the animals with that food instead of, you know, because you eat an animal, you're, also, you're actually also eating whatever it took to get to that that weight, right? So, you know, that's a, it's a huge amount of energy. It's a huge amount of waste. It's the, like I said before, biggest cause of freshwater pollution, you know, so you have to add on all these externalities. So how many people does it take to change the world? One, one, one person has an enormous amount of impact. And of course, you know, I'm, in, I'm interested in that one person and I'm interested in scale. You know, you know, tens of millions of people now have seen the game changers. I don't know. We don't have the exact figures from Netflix, but, you know, I know that they're really happy because they're asking me to come back and do some more work. Um, uh, so there's the, the films have been incredibly successful. And it's, you know, again, you know, the, the figures that you're talking about, like you said, almost only 1%, 3%. That's what they were saying about alternative energy. That's what they're saying about electric cars 20 years ago. And now look at it. Every 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 goddamn car company in the world now in the last two months has been switching to electric. Volvo, General Motors, Ford, they're all lining up after Elon playing catch up. Well, we're going to be doing the same thing with food. You know, you might think, OK, you're, you might be part of the 98 percent right now. But I, I would say but that a young person growing up today is going to find it extraordinary that our generation was eating animals for subsistence. They'll find that just as unfathomable as smoking on a plane was 25 years ago. I've been saying this for a long time. Around, if you look at the treatment we use for cancer, radiation and chemotherapy, I've always said the same thing. 20 years from now, we're going to look back and be like, oh my God, what were we doing? And the beauty is what we're talking about here around changing diet can eliminate the vast majority of the illnesses and things that we're dealing with. So this is this is really powerful stuff. Well, I'll, I'll tell you one. You know, when we were interviewing uh, Dr. Dean Ornish for um, for the Game Changers, uh, he, he has a, a couple great lines in the film. He says, you know, genes are your disposition, but they don't have to be your fate. Using that, that those four pillars we talked about earlier, he's been able to, to show that. 501 genes you could turn off good genes and turn on 
you turn on good genes, turn off bad genes, just with the, those four pillars by changing your diet, lifestyle, et cetera, et cetera. And so he's the, he, if people don't know, he's the, the first doctor to prove that you could reverse heart disease with lifestyle medicine. Um, he did it with early, early stage diabetes and prostate cancer. And by extension, I guess that means that with women, it's with the, uh, I'm not a scientist, but it means that you can do it with breast cancer too. He was working on a study to see if he could uh, halt or reverse Alzheimer's. And I'm, I'm doing a film on that. And it looks like with the early stages, it's doing very well. You know, it's, uh, people are, uh, cognitive tests are, are showing that they could get better. And, it's, and, you know, the nature of the disease is you get worse and worse and worse until you die. So, um, yeah, I'm a big proponent of, you know, whole foods, plant-based diet. I'll, I'll share a personal story around that. I've, I've worked, um, gosh, for about 20 years, I've worked with a wellness doctor down in San Diego. I call him the chief. And he was the first doctor of preventive medicine in all of Southern California. And uh, was exactly 20 years ago, my mom came down with a very rare neuromuscular disease. It was called myasthenia gravis. She had surgery. She was on very strong uh, drugs, prednisone. Her lifestyle was definitely affected by it and obviously her physical health. And, and one day I convinced her and my father to fly here to Southern California. And I said, let's go see Dr. Meltzer. And he put her on a very simple plan. And by the way, he put everyone on the exact same plan. It's exactly what we said before. Plant-based diet, exercise, meditation, reduce your stress. That was it. Within a matter of months, she was 100% healed. Her doctors called it a miracle. <laughs> they were like, this could not have happened based on changing your diet. It was just like this. They just couldn't accept that that was the reality. Yeah, unfortunately, that's a very... Uh, I wouldn't say with that disease, but it's a very common story in general when you talk about people reversing these diseases that, you know, it, it was normally thought, well, when Dean was working at, um, you know, with, the, with that first study, he was working uh, as an intern uh, with the guy who invented bypass surgery. And, you know, they were literally bypassing the problem because, you know, three, five years later, people would be back in there again getting another bypass. Because if you eat the same way, it's like your car. If you put dirty oil in the car, you're going to you know clog up the filter eventually, you know, and, you know, you can only do bypasses so much until, you know. But the thing is, with the diet that he prescribes, the lifestyle medicine he prescribes, you can, you know, you have a chance that, you know, really healing yourself he has a wonderful cartoon that he had uh, you know drawn of uh, a couple of you know doctors mopping up the floor and it, behind them the sink is overflowing <laughs> it's like that's like the metaphor for bypass surgery exactly. but now that's not to say if you you know if you're in real dire straits you know a stent or you know a bypass surgery it could be life-saving but over but oh, yeah. you don't you're you're way better off you know, changing your, your diet and people. A hundred percent. I mean, what we're, we're saying is let's be on the preventative side, not the reactive side, right? Exactly. Yeah. So let's talk racing extinction. So the night I actually met you, it was in Dana Point, California, one town over from here. And it was a sneak you did. A, I can't remember what the exact theme of that night, but you did a sneak preview of the movie. You just showed a handful of scenes. And uh, I'll never forget the opening scene was with blue whales and uh, someone who's had about probably 75 encounters with blue whales right here in Laguna Beach from a stand up paddleboard. I love the opening scene of that movie, uh, which I'm assuming you filmed here in Orange County. Is that right? Close to Mexico. Yeah. Down in the South Little. Beautiful. So and then the night the movie came out, I went to the theater to watch it and and, and, and I might have misspoke earlier when I said to me, it was a harder movie to watch because the problems that you show. It was an entertaining movie, but the problems that you show in the movie mm -hmm. can be a little overwhelming. I, but I remember watching that, sitting in the theater and thinking to myself, people eat some crazy shit. So um, tell us about the crazy stuff people eat and why. Yeah, I mean, one of the one of the things that we did in the film is we went to Guangzhou where they had the first SARS outbreak. You know, so this is uh, an illegal animal market. This is where you have all kinds of you know, animals that people in, in the West don't eat. And they eat them in Asia for something called jenbu. And jenbu basically is the idea that you are going to eat 
if you eat that animal, you consume that animal, you're going you're gonna to somehow get the attributes that that animal possesses. So if you eat, you know, rhino horn, it'll help maintain an erection. If you eat a bat, and this is important for people to understand, if you eat a bat, which has coronaviruses, that you're going to get the night vision from that animal. It'll, it'll cure glycoma. And that's why bats are in the market. That's why you have bats hanging from cages, dripping their feces and their excrement onto uh, their, 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 their urine on these animals below them. And you have these animals that normally wouldn't be together in the wild suddenly coming together and, um, you know, cr cross infecting each other. And you have these really, you know, horrible strains that get passed on. So, um, so what was interesting, after the, the first SARS outbreak, those animal markets started back up again. You know, the Chinese government said, well, I guess that's it. You know, it's problem solved. And it kind of was, but, we don't, you know, they're not coming completely clean on what's going on in Wuhan, where that was another animal market. But, you know, knowing what I've seen there at the markets and what is the animals that are brought together, of course, they're going to be incredibly embarrassed that that this worldwide problem millions of people dying around the world are 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 caused by this crazy batshit belief that if you eat a bat you're going to be able to you know to see better or to improve your vision but then again you know this is not chinese bash or asian bash we also have you know what i call american genbu this idea that to be big strong healthy and have virility you need to eat animal products it's the same thing over here these you know, the swine flu, you know, killed millions of people. You have, uh, you know, the mumps are caused by animal products. You know, the, the, the flus are, you know, bird flus, swine flus. They're all caused by the same thing. That's when you get huge amounts, aggregates of animals together, um, you know, like at a, you know, the, these CAFOs, the confined feeding operations. You have tens of thousands of chickens in one place and you you open you know the these are if, if you're you, you go through a, a rural area you see, you see these sheds that are really long and they don't have any windows they have fans on the top and if you ever go into one you, your eyes hurt you can't breathe the urine from the ammonia and the feces is so strong and this is what these animals live in because there's a reason there's a I don't want to say it's a good reason, but there's a reason economically they do that because if these animals are outside, they're going to be with ducks in a pond and then you'll have bird flus infecting that whole other strain of, of chickens. So they keep them in these windowless, windowless places. Free range just means they can walk around in an area like this, you know. It's, it's, it's a, no human would, would do that. You know, it, it, walking around in your feces and your urine, and so they have to give them these antibiotics. They have to, um, you know, keep keep them stuffed up. Of course, they got steroids so they can grow fast, but they're really unhealthy animals. And you know, all the, you know, Trump had said that you know nobody could see this coming. Well, that's except for every, you know, everybody studying pandemics. You know, uh, has been saying that hey, it's just a matter of time before a big one hits. And this is, you know, this is one of the big ones now. And now, you know, you, listen, I'm, I've got one shot of the vaccination. I'm going back home next week. I'll get my second one. But now they're saying that these strains coming out, you know, are, might not be effective or 20% effective. You know, uh, in Asia, they're, they're living with this idea because of SARS, they're still wearing masks, you know, from whatever that was, 2002 to 2003, 20 years later, they're still wearing masks. It's like, this might be the new normal. But the, here's the thing. If we stopped eating goddamn animals, the chance that 75% of these uh, viruses that we have are caused by our jimbu, our, our stupid belief that we need to eat animals to be big and healthy. If we eliminated, if everybody went on to a whole foods plant-based diet, we'd be healthier. We'd have a hell of a lot less um, pandemics. Um, the, the planet would be healthier. You know, all, all the cascade of great things that would happen including your your own personal health would improve so everything you know so i'm making another film that'll that'll talk about the you know pandemics that's the you know the first episode but um but you know my hope is that we can get the human off of this you know this this american genbu this western genbu this this crazy notion that you need to have animal products be big and strong it's insane well you're doing it is. You're doing a lot of work to 
spread that message, which is great. I, I made a statement, gosh, about a year ago now, when the pandemic first kind of took off, I said that, that basically that a, a return to normal would be a slow march into a burning house. It would be a suicide mission. I said, this is mother nature's whisper, let's not make her scream. And my concern right now is that life, we're already seeing it, things are kind of shifting back to a quote unquote normal. And my concern is that another pandemic, maybe way worse, would follow. I've heard you use the term the age of the pandemics. I'm hoping this is more of an age of the Aquarius, a real awakening. Um, it's almost like the earth is saying, hey, look, we don't need you. Either you figure this out or else. So is this a wake up call? And will we heed the call? Yeah, well, I think, you know, what we have to do is, is, is do some reframing. You know, you have to look at the situation that we're in and, and figure out, OK, well, what's going to work? You know, because you can't con con condemn people. You know, I, I don't think that works that, that well. You know, uh, you should be, you know, probably emphasizing more what they're gaining than what they're losing. You know, in, in the eight, in the, okay, <laughs> with the pandemic, I mean, what else do we need to say? You know, okay, well, first of all, let's, let's stop eating bats, like baseline, right? Okay, let's keep those coronaviruses where they belong in the caves. And I know that, you know, some bats migrate out to the trees and stuff, but they're mostly in caves, you know, we should, you know, put those off the menu because they're really bad, right? <laughs> Trillions of dollars lost, millions of lives lost. Um, you know, we're social creatures. You know, humans are social creatures. And this is, you know, this is the, the, one of the worst things for social health is that we're, you know, we, we can't be next to our, you know, the people that we love. My mother died of, you know, um, and... and she, when she went to the hospital, no, you know, none of her family could be with her. She died, you know, alone. With, with, you know, just the idea that this is happening because of a, a couple people, you know, think that they need to eat, you know, bats or that they're, they eat, eat animal products. I mean, come on, let's, let's just, just do some basic research of why, the, why these, you know, what, what causes pandemics. They're, these are zoonotic diseases you know, be caused by the use of animals. So, I don't know. I mean, we're, we're, we're working hard. I think that's one way we can scale this up is by doing films. That's the dream anyway. Um, it's, it's worked on small scales. It's working with large scales. We just have to keep on, you know, adjusting and tell entertaining stories, tell true stories, and, and hopefully we can get that 10% number so that, you know, it's a very different conversation, you know, 10, 15 years from now. I think it will be. I'm sorry to hear about your mom, man. It's... That's tough. Um, you know, she, well, she lived a long life, but um, it's still, I mean, I know that there's, a, it, it's like, God, it's like, you, you get to be that age. You just want to be, you know, that's, it's all about family, right? And, Ugh. and um, I, there's just so many people suffering because of, I don't want to say the stupidity, but the ignorance of, of, of groups. And listen, I think we're all, you know, we all have blind spots. I know I've got a lot of them. I, you know, just, uh, I wasn't <laughs> born with a, you know, a way to, to a way to live. I'm, I'm learning as we go, but, um, but the, we, we need to scale up quicker. We, we can't say that, Hey, what we used to do two years ago works because it doesn't, you know? Well, that's the whole point. We, I like that you said ignorance, not stupidity. It's we're ignorant, meaning we just lack a knowledge, but now we have the knowledge and we no longer have the luxury of time. And to your point, we need to, we need to scale up much faster. And I, I feel like it's happening, which is the good news. So sticking with pandemics for another minute, lots of this originates in Asia. Sadly, now we are seeing hate crimes against Asian Americans, which is awful. But when we look at how our food <laughs> is made right here and the vast majority of meat in the u.s is basically slaughtered and processed in what like seven massively large buildings like you were talking about i mean this could easily happen right here in fact if i understand correctly what we call the spanish flu actually did start here am i right yeah i mean there's there's some debate on how it actually originated but yeah it's from animals it's definitely a zoo not another zoonotic disease um you know the one of the issues is that they do mutate quite quickly and like that's you know now that we have better sensing devices right so we can figure out like we're looking at these mutations now coming out of brazil and south africa and you know things things change pretty quickly um but yeah i mean this is not a like like i said it's it, to me it's western genbu 
you know it's not just a, an asian thing it's it happens over there because they're you know in china there there's a lot more people there's one one and a half billion people you go over there you you don't hear birds singing you know because they, they're eating everything that they can and there's also you know probably a you know a very real idea that if it comes from nature it might be healthier than what they're processing because you go to the you know the, there's areas where they have these you know the, you know the, the the aquatic you know fish farms and they stink to high heaven and they they go on forever forever i mean it's just a you know you know how are you going to feed the hungry population? How do you feed a hungry planet on, on animal products? You know we're that's we have to to go down mow down the forest. We have to you know the the Amazon people say well look at all the soybeans that they're planting over in in Brazil. That's the problem. Well, seventy percent of those soybeans are used to feed cows that they're exporting to China or America. You know so uh, you know it's just it's just not efficient. It's not an efficient. You know f forget the health reasons. Um, you know, if you were if you were gonna if you're gonna re repopulate Mars, you wouldn't start f putting animals up there. That's not how you would feed a population. It's just so stupid. You know, <laughs> it's not sustainable. That's for darn sure. Right. Well, it's, and, it's, and it's listen. If you, if we want to have nature the way that we were in, enjoying assemblies of it right now, um, we're gonna have to get off of animal products. I mean, what's going on right now? I mean, the, the extinction rate's just out of control. Um, but I want to hear about how you switched over to plant-based mm -hmm. for me. It was about 16 years ago. I've been on a primarily plant-based diet and I first made the switch because I realized that was the best thing for my personal health. Uh, I wasn't sick, but I just realized I was like, wait, this is the, to the point your points you were making before, like, this is just a healthier way to live. And then it was kind of cool as I got more into it, it became more of a moral thing. And then it became really a spiritual thing. Like if I really love all of life, how can I eat? How can I eat it? How can I eat animals? And I believe you switched for more of a specific health reason, not a moral reason. Is that right? No. Well, f sort of back ass words. You know, I, uh, in 1986, <laughs> I I was working um, with Fortune magazine. I was doing a story on the biggest independently owned cattle ranches in America, and I went to a slaughterhouse. And they put what's called a captive bolt to the brain. It's basically like a pneumatic, you know, spike that hits the brain. It's supposed to kill the animal instantly, and they hang it upside down. They rip the flesh off, and then they, they basically—it's like the opposite of a of a car company. Instead of putting a car back together as it or together as it goes around a conveyor belt, they're they're taking it apart. So they're ripping. You know, people are cutting off parts of this animal, and one of the cows wasn't killed sufficiently it had consciousness because it's hanging upside down and as it's going around it's, it locks my eye and its head's turning and looking at me as it's going around and I thought I can't be party to this but I always but I thought that yeah I have to eat animals you know 1986 I thought I had to eat animals to be you know strong and healthy so I thought well I'll eat lower on the food chain I'll eat fish I'll only eat fish because they're less sentient and intelligent of course now we know that that's not true at all but, you know, I lived with this fantasy for quite a while. I was a pescatarian. I didn't eat anything that walked. And then um, when I was doing the cove, well, of course, the cove, if, if people haven't seen it, a lot of it has to do with um, not just the killing of dolphins, but they were actually force feeding them to school children in the school system there. And they had a plan to, uh, to spread it all over to the country. Um, and even though every dolphin that's been tested in Japan in the last 20 years has anywhere from five to 5,000 times more mercury if it was a fish because there's a loophole because it's a mammal they said well they could they could you know serve it uh, but and you have to eat everything on your plate at, in the school system so they were literally being force feeding poison to kids to children and um, so one of the things that we did is we went to Minamata where they had the first mercury outbreak. This was a, a company that was making plastics and was intentionally dumping mercury into the bay. And mercury is the most toxic, non-radioactive element in the world. There's no, there's nothing required in your body that needs mercury. It's a, it's a poison. Just a tooth filling in a 20-acre lake could poison the whole thing. It's a, it's a really, um, you know, 
deleterious effects of, of mercury. And, you know, I think 200,000 people were affected by it. You know, maybe a thousand or more people died, but it, it, it basically erases what it means to be human. It, it starts to rot out your brain and destroy your nervous system so you can't feel t touch is one of the first things to go. You're hearing your sight. It, it slowly erases what it means to be human is what one of the Japanese doctors told me. And um, he was showing me this book that he had. This is in Minamata University. And he showed me all the mercury that was coming out of the fish. And it was, the highest was out of, out, off the coast of America and Alaska. And I thought, oh my God, I eat a lot of fish. I should look at it. One of the, the last scenes we do in the film of the Cove is we took uh, a hair sample, the deputy minister of fisheries, Hideki Morinuki, and we sent his hair sample off to the lab. And I was in Japan and I was eating fish for breakfast, noon, and, and dinner because that, that was my main source of, of, of food. I was, I was in heaven. I thought, just for the nuts of it, I'm going to put my, a sample of my hair because they can measure uh, mercury by the hair or in your blood. And uh, when the results came back from Morinuki, um, the researchers said, well, this guy's is off the, he, he's four times, he, he's, he's four times, no, eight times higher than, than what's considered high, you know, wow. like too much. And he said, but this other person is 44 times higher. My, my, my mercury levels were higher than the deputy minister, minister of fisheries. And he said, you know, you got You have to whatever you're doing. You have to stop eating. You know. You have to change your diet. And the the, the shock that went through me, I can't tell you. I mean, um, imagine that. I thought I was e eating this incredibly healthy way, and I had a whole host of symptoms that you know I could relate. But there were you know there's a whole list I carried on my my phone for a while. But I had a bunch of them. You know, uh, muscle aches, short term memory loss, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, if you see the if you see the brain of somebody with with mercury poison it almost looks like like swiss cheese it starts to etch out the the, the hmm. nerve endings and uh so i had to change my diet and i and this is when we were doing the cove and i went down to to los angeles and i met i met this woman rebecca mink i was having lunch with her and i found out that she was a she was a vegan it was the first vegan i've ever really met and talked to and i said i said what do you eat and she goes <laughs> everything else you know all right. protein originates in plants and that was that was the journey you know um uh, and then luckily mercury has a half-life in your body of about 70 to 90 days and um after about a, a couple years i got it down to you know like a few parts per million which is still really high and i started to eat uh, small fish and then you know it went back up again i thought okay i can't i can't mess around with this and so off of start the, the journey to me long-winded way to say the, the journey started up moral but i was only a half moral, okay. and it and it was mm -hmm. really the health reasons that i went that direction and then of course once once you realize that you don't need fish like yourself or, or animal products you realize that you know listen all these animals are dying it's horrible you know if you go to the CAFOs, the confined feeding operations if you look at the way that that animals are treated in these fish ponds that the you know there's fish can count they can you know they use sound they use music to communicate you know the the list goes on it's like we're, we're all this these animals are sentient intelligent from dolphins you know on where you want to consider lower uh, through the food chain it's like why are we doing this we're 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 causing all this suffering for the planet for ourselves and you could you know and and I understand the switch out there. If anybody's saying, you know, this guy's, a, you know, we're both lunatics, you know, they're on a plant-based diet. Well, I understand that. I mean, that's how I felt too. I mean, I've always thought like, you know, the vegans or the vegetarians are crazy. They're not like us. You know, don't they get it? You know, well, you know, watch, watch the Game Changers, you know, watch, you know, watch that film. And I, I dare you to not question your own um, eating habits if, if uh, you know, you watch the film to the end. Yeah, watch it tonight. And it, it takes a little time. I mean, it's, it's, um, I kind of went cold turkey, but it's no pun intended. Um, but it's, you know, we're, these are ingrained habits that we have. It, it's social. We're brought up in families, you know, eating these ways. So it definitely, it, it's definitely a switch. So, devil's advocate, real quick. Um, what do you say to the 1 billion people that rely on fish as the major part of their diet? That's a good question. You know, I, I tell you, 
you have to do something else, you know, like when, you know, we had some, some people that worked on the Cove and they were working in Boulder, Colorado, when uh, they were protesting, protesting Rocky Flats. Rocky Flats was making plutonium triggers for nuclear bombs, right? And, you know, the, the, the people working at the plant came out and told, told the protesters, well, what are we going to do? If we're not making plutonium, you know, bombs, you know, what are we going to do for work? Well, you know, a billion people can't eat fish. You know, the, uh, seven and a half people certainly can't eat fish. Um, you know, you look at what's going on right now. I mean, we're, we're, we're fishing out the seas. You know, most of the, the, the fishing practices of most of the planet, you know, are not sustainable. Now, to those billion people, if they're living in, like, subsistence, they, you know, they're going to, it's going to be a, a, a switch. I tell you, I, I've got, you know, one story I want to tell before we have to wrap it up in, like, eight minutes. But, like, we, when we were making the Cove, um, I was going down to the International Whaling Commission meet, meeting, and I was, I was hoping to meet and talk with people like uh, Joji Morishita, the head of the, of the, the Japanese delegate, right, for, for whaling. And um, so I'm, we're, we're doing one of our last scenes in the film there. And I'm on a plane. I, the, the, the plane seats were so strict or, we, you know, I couldn't even sit next to somebody from my crew. But there was one seat on the plane. And um, my, you know, my crew was, you know, throughout the, the plane. And I, I was hoping that, okay, well, maybe when the plane takes off, one of my crew can sit there. And it turns out we were waiting for one other passenger. And it was, um, uh, it was the, the deputy minister of fishing for, for Japan. And he sits down right next to me. Wow. And I, you know, I'd never met him before, but I'd seen him at the whaling commission. Meeting. So this is Joji Morishita's boss, the guy that's in charge of whaling, dolphin hunting, fishing, you know, all fishing. And he sits down right next to me. And, and my, like my crew's looking at me like, you know, can you believe this? And, I, I, thought, and I thought, if there's a God, he or she has a great sense of humor. That's right. And so I, I try to be strategic. I didn't say anything. I waited till we got served our meal and so that he couldn't switch with anybody comfortably. And I said, do you, do you know who I am? And he goes, no. I said, I know who you are. I want to show you this film I've been working on. I showed him some snippets of The Cove. And he was just like you know, livid, you know, that we had, we had got that, that footage. And a couple of things were going on about that time. Uh, the Australians had just found out that uh, the Japanese tuna fleet had been overfishing knowingly for about 20 years. You know, like I, I calculated it out. It was like, you know, a, a, a train car, you know, a, a regular train that you see with coals, about 110 cars. They had knowingly taken out like, you know, 220, uh, you know, cars of, uh, of fish, of the legal tuna legally out of the, out of the oceans. And, you know, so I said, so I said to this guy, you know, um, Akira Nakamai was his name, is his name. And I said, you're in charge of, you know, thousands of tons. You know, imagine they're, they're killing tens of thousands of dolphins every year that, that are poisoned. I said, you're killing you know, 23,000 dolphins and porpoises every year that you know are poison. How do you reconcile that? And he said, well, I'm, I'm in charge of food security, not food safety. In other words, this was the Ministry of Health problem, not his. Wow. And he says, you know, then I, then I brought up, you know, the, the, the tuna that they, that they were knowingly, illegally taking for decades. And they were paying, you know, the, the members of the, um, you know, the Tuna League, I forget what, it, forget what it's called over there, the Pacific, you know, Tuna um, Committee or whatever. They, uh, they, they were, the, the Australians were saying they were, the, the Japanese at that point would have paid them anything to shut them up, but they, they went public with it. And I, then I mentioned that, you know, to Nakamai what, uh, what was going on, you know, with the tuna. And he says, listen, I'm in charge of food security for 145 million people. And we're, our surface area is about the same as is your California, but we're, there's a lot of st steep hills. Only 17 percent of the the area is you know flat enough to grow food on. What are we going to do? We have to look to the sea. You know, 
to that, you know, to the same way, you know, what are a billion people going to eat? I don't know, something else. You're, you're just like the Rocky Flats people, you know, they, they, they moved on. They got, they had different jobs. The fishermen, you're fishing out the seas. So you have global warming. The reefs are disappearing. You know, I don't know what they're going to do. They're, but we're going to have to figure out something else. And I, I'll tell you what, it's going to be in the plant-based world that we need to do it. You know, um, you know, look at what Pat Brown is doing with Impossible. You know, here's a guy that... You know, Pat Brown's an amazing. The people don't know he started Impossible Meats, right? Uh, what people might not know about Pat was that um, that he was working at Stanford, and one of the things that he did, he was leading a team of researchers to figure out how does cancer uh, replicate to infect another cell. And he's won all sorts of awards, he and his teams. And he took a, an 18-month sabbatical to try to figure out what's the most important thing I can do with the rest of my life. And he figured out that to save the climate, to save people's lives, because it, it's like, you, you know, people, if people are eating the same way, you're not going to be able to save them. He said, the, the, the most important thing I can do is to figure out how plants can taste like meat, because that's the biggest problem that, that he has. And now it's an incredibly successful company. If you ever had an Impossible Burger, it's incredible, you know. And he told me, he says, the, you know, listen, the cow's not tasting any better, but we can improve you know, our, our, our meat every, every week, you know, that, yeah. that we're out there. Um, so there's a lot of great people working on this subject, you know, working on, on, on multiple planes, you know, cellular meat, you know, the people adjust They're you know, over in Singapore, they just released the first cellular meat, you know, so this is actually no, no animals harm. They just take like a cell of a feather of a chicken and they're able to replicate, right. you know, make, yeah. make meat patties that are actually meat. It's not like, doesn't just taste like meat. It is meat. I think it's interesting too, as you go on to a plant-based diet, you don't even want to taste the meat anymore. So, but I, I agree with you, the work that Impossible is doing and others. And I will say to you, my closing thought, Louis, is the most important work that you can be doing is exactly what you're doing. So oh, thank you. keep making films, keep putting the word out there. It's making a huge impact. Uh, I'm gonna make sure to share the links to all your films and projects and OPS. I hope we can uh, have another conversation like this really soon. I'm going to give you the, the floor here for your final thought, please. Oh, that's it. Well, thank you, Rich. Yeah, and I just want to say that, you know, it's, 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 uh, it, uh, you know, it's, uh, I have a, some great teams working, you know, great editors, great writers, great, you know, cinematographers. There's a, a lot of people that are behind, you know, me. You know, I might be the, the face and the voice of, of, a, or, of OPS, but, you know, it's really the people that, um, that come and make a film, bring it together that, you know, we can, we can do the work that we do. And, you know, I just one other closing thought is that, you know, we're, we're doing this film right now, um, just in the, the, the final bits of it. It's called Act Like a Holy Man. It's a, it's, a, it's a film about the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu, who are best friends. They're both, of course, of course, Nobel Prize winners. But we spent, our team spent four and a half days in Dharamsala, India with them about, you know, how do you find joy? In a world full of sorrow, how do you find joy? And the key, the real takeaway from that film is if, if you're in service to the, something bigger than yourself, if you're in service to other people, if you're, if you're more concerned with bringing joy and happiness to other people, that's what brings you lasting joy. It's not the money. It's not the fame. It's not the, the power. It's not the sex. What it is is the thing that's going to make you feel really happy, You know, make you wake up in the morning and feel like, there's not enough days, you know, hours in the, in the day instead of like a work where you're like, you just can't wait for it to be over. That's the key to happiness, I think. On that note, <laughs> we will end. Louis, I appreciate you. Keep doing the work. Keep putting the love out there. You're awesome. I appreciate this. I look forward to doing this again so we can go even deeper. That is our show, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I do. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, Rich. Cheers. Bye-bye.